And welcome along to the Escapade Show, episode 34. 34. Can you believe it? Right, 34. And we are joined today with a very, very, very special guest, Darren McGarvey, a.k.a. Loki. Hi, guys. It's good to be with you today. Brilliant, man. How's it going? How's it going? I'm good, I am good. This is a really impressive setup here, I have Thank to you. say. It really is, man. Um, and I, 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 I frequent various media places and... You know, the podcast situation with a lot of people is very basic, which is cool as well. Yeah. You can have all the good gear in the world, and if, if, if you can't host it, then it's rubbish. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think you guys have got a pretty good mix of yeah. situation going on Thank here. Thank you. We most definitely started on, you know, the Nothing. ultimate basics, i.e. a phone. <laughs> that and phone with a white balance, mate. I know. I know. It just helps being able to get a team of people, doesn't it? Because it? Does. it really is a big production when you get down there. We were saying to Malk, one of the guys that works with us setting up today, he wasn't even aware before he came and joined us that there was a whole team here. He thought it was just me and Gal throwing the two cameras up and off we pop. Mm -hmm. And all the lights you see and obviously the, the whole background and stuff in order to put it together, right? It's, it's a, an operation. No, I, well think done. I think we'd have done Cheers. half the podcast if it was just me and you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <threw it> up. <laughs> So I uh, thanks so much, mate. Thanks so much. I mean, as Stephen said, like we've we truly worked hard to to kind of get to this point, and um, uh, you know, for us, it is it's great to have that and sort of be able to put something together that's quite nicely polished. But you know, it's all about the guests uh, for us and interviewing creative minds like yourself. Um, so last night, let's just kick off with that. So last night you were part of a debate. You're on the, the big screen. That's right. I was doing my first kind of TV thing, really, I've done in a few months, which was uh, a guest on Debate Night, which is kind of the Scottish answer to question time. And it was... I thought it was all right. I mean, from my, my, my own experience, the there's things that you can always expect from that sort of stuff. You're going to have a Brexit slash Scottish independence question. Obviously, a Brexit question won't come up is less likely to come up now, thankfully. <laughs> and uh, then you're gonna um, you're gonna have audience members that are just gonna go on a wee bit too much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, but I just remember I was just kind of sitting there and I was like, actually, I feel alright because you can feel dead nervous before it. You know, really, that's the point I'm trying to get to. It's like, really, regardless of if, if people are watching it at home and thinking what it looks like, what you're doing is you're trying to overcome a lot of negative thoughts and anxieties and nerves before you go on, while also not being too sheepish because you've got to stand your ground and argue a point or mm -hmm. deal with criticism. And so, like, it's testing, but after it, it's a nice feeling. Mm -hmm. okay, it's, it's the sort of feeling I would imagine if you were nervous about doing a parachute jump and you're standing in the plane and you're like, I can't do it, somebody's cut the cables, I can't do it. And then <laughs> the pilot's just like, go. And you do it, and mm. then you land, you're like, oh, that was nice, you mm. know? That was Ultimate nice. buzz. Aye. I managed it. Mm. And do you feel that it's that sort of nervousness going to do a TV debate like that, where you're up against some prestigious people, is a similar feeling to when you jump on stage and you're, you're rapping? It's slightly different because when I'm rapping, usually I'm performing in my home crowd. So even if I was to forget my stuff, like I would just have a laugh. I mean, that's very rare that that would happen. But there's a sort of familiarity there. Whereas when you're doing political and public debate stuff, then uh, you're assured that there's going to be a diverse range of opinions in the audience. So all your stuff is being scrutinised for different angles at the same time. Mm. And you've got to be ready to deal with that. So really, it's it, it's two different things. It's two different disciplines. Obviously, you can operate with a certain amount of confidence in the fact that you've done the thing loads before, but the, no other skills are transferable. Although the battle rap skill is transferable. Definitely. Because, you know, like, I, I don't see any of the current crop of the political class, like, coming out with a better put down than me if it came to it. <laughs> if it comes to a slagging match, you're uh, wanting that. That's interesting. Does um does it get easier like the TV experiences? You know, because it, it's so monumental. Yeah. You know? Well, what's interesting, my experience has been that you get used to them being at a certain level, but then things shift in your career. So then you do a TV experience that's bigger, mm -hmm. and so then you have the appropriate level of anxiety. Oh, yeah. to call Definitely. it that. Yeah, yeah. But yesterday, I kind of <laughs> went in. I, I was. I just enjoyed it because, like, you know, I had to, I had to take some time off because I wasn't very well, I wasn't taking care of myself. 
and just had to say game's a bogey, you know. And so what I really appreciated last night was like just a moment of kind of being very present. And because I'd continued to work even when I wasn't well, so I didn't feel in command of what I was doing. I didn't really feel any great deal of authorship over what I was saying. I was on autopilot. I was phoning it in and getting away with phoning it in, to be fair, which most people can mm -hmm. for a certain period of time. But last night I just felt dead present. You know, I was able to hear everything everyone was saying. I was trying my best to be kind of polite and accommodating of yep. different viewpoints, but but draw the line where it needs to be drawn sometimes. But it was just good having that presence of mind and that gratitude, you know, like, all right, cool, I'm, I'm back at work, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I feel good. That's the kind of ultimate goal, isn't it? It's like trying to be conscious of being present. Is like the real battle sometimes, it's, isn't it? It's something we really try and do every day as well. Is is being grateful for you know waking and up checking again. Yourself you know, that what that's I mean? the actually you know keep keep in check with that. You Absolutely, know? and you know I think um, like you know getting back because as you said you've been a few months off, so that's good to see you a wee bit more self care and mm. drinking your water in the morning <laughs> and uh, which we were talking about. But one thing I said to you in the van on the way over, um, which you probably agree with, is like, do you really think you could have been that level headed Loki on the telly ten years ago? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's uh, there would have been so many other factors that would have played into how I would have handled this had it happened 10 years ago. And indeed, I believe the circumstances of my now are a product of me growing and changing and making positive adjustments. Uh, but let's just say for talking sake, you know, that 10 years ago I decided to write a book and all of the same things that's happened to me now happened then. Mm. Uh, would have crashed and burned. I wouldn't have made it back for London the first weekend I went down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would have just ended up like hooking up with local rappers down there and just like mm. ending up staying down there and 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 just would have got like probably quite heavily intoxicated. And I would have been intoxicated with most of my media appearances as well to varying degrees. Mm -hmm. And while sometimes I'm not going to lie and say that. I mean, one of the reasons why I like to get intoxicated was for that initial grace period of maybe 15, 20 minutes to an hour where you feel good and your confidence kind of seems to swell a little bit and you feel in more command of your thoughts and your language or at least you're becoming drunker. So More confident enough to say it? Aye, more confident to say it and also less self-critical. But that can be a negative thing. Like, I used to record a lot of music drunk and think it was great and it wasn't great. When I listen back to it now, I'm like, why did anybody let me put that out? Like, mm -hmm. it's because I was too sensitive to criticise, you yeah. know? But the, the what I realised was that, <laughs> what I realised <laughs> was, do you know what I mean? No, yeah, like, yeah, totally. So, so what, what I think, if, I, if it was like, if, it. If, the, if, the, if, the, if the tables were turned and I was cutting about in that nick, on TV, I'd probably end up making a name for myself as a bit of a live wire who was a bit cheeky and, uh, and, and, and ultimately I think the novelty would have wore off. Because eventually, like, you just burn bridges with people. People just don't think you're good to deal with. Not even for a commercial perspective. Just, like, how many times do people want to sit in a room with somebody that's just kind of emoting negative energy all the time? Mm -hmm. It's just people don't feel safe and secure. Yeah. And uh, and I just, I just I, I feel like the way I do it now, I, I, I still retain some of the same characteristics from those days um, because that's part of my nature. But I think now I kind of can see where my defects can creep in. And sometimes you need to pull a wee defect mm -hmm. out, you know what I mean? And be like, here's my ego, do you know what I mean? Yeah, Don't yeah. cross this line or I'm telling you, it's not going to end well for you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to do that. But most of the time I'm kind of trying to come from a place of understanding and actually find that I learn more from people because I'm more willing to speak to people. So I'm not just learning what their point of view is, I'm learning their whole context emotionally, like what's the inner world that's creating all their beliefs and just means life is richer and mm -hmm. more complex and no overwhelmingly so, but I just feel confident that if I was to be parachuted into any room with any group of people, I have the skills to develop a rapport with them, mm -hmm. whether they're rich or poor or black or white or male yeah. or female, and, and that's something that I'm ha I'm grateful for. Yeah, and to be proud of, for sure. You know, going through that journey, and especially for us, you, we've got a lot of books in here, and the more you kind of learn about that, it's all about placing yourself as much as possible in other person's like, shoes, because yeah. you don't know what's leading them to that point where they're asking you something or coming across a bit, you know, sketchy or whatever else. It's Something's obviously happening. The ability to put yourself in 
and their viewpoint is is yeah. so strong. I think that's the beauty of uh you know one half of the business of what we do. I was mm. saying earlier, you know, is we work yep. in the community and work with you know people that need help, that need positive role models in their life, especially male positive role models, especially for a lot of the wee guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that is it's just it's just growing and learning, and, and it gives you that perspective to put yourself in someone's shoes because you're like, okay, I've not went through that exact adversity. I've been through my own, but let me hear it from theirs. It's like the whole like build up for an artist or the struggle as a building an artist. It's like they say if you split your time with helping people who really need it and then spend some time. So it's thirty three percent with you know people who really need the help. Mm-hmm. So you've got that perspective and then say the other thirty three percent with people that are aspiring as you are and then the other thirty three percent of people you're looking up to. Yeah. If you can keep that balance of who you've got around, they say it's like the best kind of course of action like when you're grown. Yeah, mm. it's kind of w- what I've realised as well, and this is kind of um, something that I've observed in my uh, studying how people think and behave, like in terms of their social attitudes or their politics or things like that. So what we're talking about there is empathy, right? So we're talking about having the empathy and the presence of mind to say, okay, this person might not be agreeable to me, let me think about what it is that's driving that. Or maybe this person is behaving mm-hmm. antisocially or, or in some way you're trying to think rather than resort to kind of discipline or resort to judgment. Mm-hmm. What other strategies have I got here mm-hmm. to just keep this interaction going until something changes? And, and, and what I find is the empathy can only come into play. We're only capable of empathy when our emotional world is in order in some yeah. way. So you notice that when you're under stress, emotional stress, you're not capable of empathy. In fact, the empathy shuts down because you're only capable of fight or flight. Like, am I going? Am I staying? You're reduced to binary choices when you're stressed. Is that an apple? Is it a 10-pack of toffee crisps? Do you know what I mean? Like, And often we make the bad choices under stress, even with our best intentions. The stress kicks in and then that's it. Like, well, I... But I, I woke up the day and I said I was going to do A, B and C and how come I've just, like, short-circuited straight to Z? Ah, oh, never mind, you know? And and so the empathy, like, we need to be emotionally, like, secure enough to empathise with somebody else. But see other people who are stressed all the time, one, they can't empathise or they struggle to empathise, but two, they'll criticise you for trying to empathise because that's safety behaviour for them. So that makes them feel more secure in their inability or unwillingness to empathise. And generally, that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So what you'll find is in your life, you'll find situations where you might be trying to empathise with somebody that other people have decided is not worth your time. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a young person in the street, whether it's somebody who holds unsavoury political beliefs, whatever it might be. And that's a real social pressure. It's a real social pressure for us these days, man. Other people applying their emotional standards and limitations to us. And and, and that's something that I try to empathise with. (laughs) But also say that's no for me. Yeah. You know, it's no for me. Huge. The thing as well, though, all humans do get stressed, though, as well. And it's known when you're in that as well, isn't it? Because it's like, obviously, the, the goal is to try and... I don't even think the stress freeze is a real thing, is it? No. Because we all do no, feel it overwhelming no. as yeah. coming on and, and yeah. I guess recognising it's, it's the key. I it? think the main thing for me definitely is being self-aware. Mm. It's self-awareness and knowing when and exactly that, like under stress, you're not going to make the right decisions. Depends on what the stress is. Mm. It might be this type of stress that you need to go out and perform and you go out and perform the best you've ever done with that Nel- stress. Nervous uh-huh. sort of stress. Or it's the stress of, oh my God, I can't pay my rent. I'm going to get mm. flung out. I'm or going a to tiger's act violent. Cha- or- and a tiger's chasing me in the African savannah. <laughs> You know, like, I'm going to run faster than I ever aye, have now. And I'm going to go ahead with it. You know, like, that's, that's what the stress response is. So it's very effective for survival. But yeah. in a contemporary setting, it's not. we're overwhelmed with all sorts of stimulus. So it's just depending on our upbringing, our, our influences, what we put in and out of our bodies and our thinking, mm-hmm. we can just be completely dictated to by this stress response. And mm-hmm. if you look at the state of our society right now, or how society feels rather, mm-hmm. then you see stress is a big part of it. It's and huge. It's, but also imperceptible. It's a bit like social media media the reason the debates are so difficult to have is because we're trying to have them on twitter <laughs> and we're not evolved to deal with just talking to somebody on a screen we need to see them and feel them you know mm. well that's you you, yeah. you mentioned that earlier because it's so easy to just quote or misquote somebody for a bit of text but it's like it's like even when you text your pal and you might be like you know you 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 might be totally in a good mood saying how are you but then how are you that's a bit dry in it but, so but much. the way you put it across or whatever mm. it could be totally unintentional do you know what i mean and <laughs> it it's like why is he being pure dry and wide with me this morning or whatever and it's yeah. like actually what do you mean what are you talking about I'm just it's just a text mate chill out you know see, see, here's, here's my kind of take right 
I always sort of look at it kind of like on one hand we're humans, we're dead sophisticated, look at the world we've created, right? But we did that collectively as individuals. Well, no, really that smart. Like, how many times <laughs> have you been 30 feet away from someone walking the same stretch of road as you? You know that you're both about to intercept each other. You know there's a chance you might bump into each other. You both keep taking evasive action to move in the other <laughs> direction and still you hit each other anyway. Like, that happens to me quite a lot. Because right? <laughs> every time there's, there's a kind of uncanny valley between you seeing the other person move, you thinking about that, you taking the action to move, yep. and by the time you've done that, they're trying to evade you, so you bump into each other. So evolutionarily, <laughs> we're not that sophisticated. When we work together, we create wonderful mm -hmm. things, but we're actually just like, we're like old Nokias. You know what I mean? When we work together, we're like a, we're like a big supercomputer, right? Yeah. So when you're thinking about communication, you're thinking about the fact that we are evolved to communicate through f primarily body language first and foremost, right? And then kind of vocal tones, right? Language hasn't developed yet. We're communicating through every other possible means but speech, but language. What social media is kind of cashing in on is that one, we're hardwired to communicate and to connect, but we're not actually like physiologically capable of truly understanding what someone else is saying through social media mm -hmm. because that's not how we've evolved to communicate. Because yeah. so, you read emotions and stuff as exactly, well. You can't see that. La language is our most recent evolutionary acquisition. So we were doing everything else that we do before we could speak to each other. And that's before the development of, of complex language. Like, I'm not just talking about grunting and all that sort of stuff, although I do have quite a bit of that as well sometimes. <laughs> Fish so, in the morning. So it's just, it's just this, it's, it's, I think we're living in a time where the real influences that are shaping how we think and feel and behave and all of the impacts of that are so all-encompassing that we can no longer detect that they're there. Things like stress. Things mm -hmm. like social media, a profound, yeah. powerful, revolutionary technology that, that that we don't really understand, but now every single person in the world has it. And well, it's changed the face of the earth. And, and you wonder why there's such a mental health crisis. I mean, this is a technology that because it's you've got private companies owning it and, and, and basically extracting value from all of the conflict that we have, mm -hmm. all the misunderstanding. I mean, this, this incentivizes us to fight. This incentivizes us to be inauthentic. This incentivizes us to be self-seeking and disingenuous and resentful because it makes a lot of people money. And then we wonder why we go home and we feel like imposters. <laughs> we wonder why we go home and we feel emotionally hungover. It's because we are imposters. Yeah. It's because we are emotionally hungover because this is like we spiritually injure ourselves every time we play into that algorithmic yeah. setting. And and it's just, but it's so pervasive. We might have a wee slight bit of awareness, like just peeking out of Plato's cave for two seconds. And then we're back in, watching the shadows, thinking this is reality. And it's just like, man, you're lucky if you even get that three seconds of awareness that that's what's actually happening before Aye. you're right back in. Like, all right, I'm going to get this one. <laughs> well, the, the whole comparisons, you know, like, you know, like people comparing themselves, that's the saddest part of it all here because it's like everybody should realise their own true uniqueness about themselves and what, what makes us all unique characters. Because if we're all the same, it would be pretty good for a couple of weeks and then you'd be like, here, I'm, I'm choking for an argument, man. Or, or you know, you... <laughs> you, 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 I'm <laughs> yeah. just wanting another contrast yeah, yeah. and viewpoint to, to, to fight with here. Mm. And I think um, social media is breeding all of that. It really is. And you're talking about mental health and all this and even stress. It's 100% it's related because mm. it's spiked in the last 15 years. What's been here for the last 15 years? Social media. Do you think it'll go on like a full circle tipping point though where Hope so. gradually though the youngsters will go, do you know what? Well, we've noticed this and let's go back. I think young people use social media in a different way and they use it to connect in different ways because maybe for different reasons. So a lot of their social media is not necessarily about arguing about things. It's just about talking to each other. You know, you sit and playing Call of Duty mm. or something like that. Um, I mean, that even, that, that, that I, I, I wasn't even involved in that culture of talking to someone while you're playing a computer. See, like, we do. Yeah. We do. We See, I couldn't imagine doing that. Like, I, I want peace the computer when I'm playing the game, I'm mm -hmm. trying to get immersed in this yeah. world. Like, I'm escaping from reality. I don't want to know what we Jimmy do in the road, got to say, yeah. or not I mean. Or aye, but when we Jimmy's telling you there's a guy coming around the corner and you aye, get him. Because you're both in the game. <laughs> All oh, right, aye, okay. Aye. See, you know, I'm just perceiving it as you're talking as an aside. No, no. It's like a side in the game, of playing the game. It's part of the same thing. Aye. Right, so you're both immersed in the yeah, same yeah. reality. Right, but, okay. But an Xbox party 
we could have eight people in there and two people are playing another game. game. Somebody's right. playing FIFA, somebody's playing that. So there, that would be, it's now we're just talking. I think there's more value in anything when you can hear someone's voice. Uh, obviously, you're never going to have virtual reality gaming to the extent where you're physically present in the same place. But I think when you're just dealing with text, that's a problem because you're projecting so much stuff. So any social media where there's voice contact, I think is infinitely better. Yeah, than video. Just, and then you get these artificial constraints on how long someone can speak for, like the 240 characters on mm. Twitter <clears throat> and all the alg and also the way the algorithms now prioritise and deprioritise whatever they see fit. So you'll be getting adverts. Uh, for products you've been talking to your partner about in the kitchen yeah, yeah. within moments but at the same time your song that you've took ages making when you post it on SoundCloud on Facebook <laughs> they're just like ah here mate what are you doing putting your music on Facebook mate don't be mental mate I know, I know. get that to the bottom of the news feed you know, if anybody even you're not even going to be able to see it mate I know, you know, I mean? I know it's crazy <laughs> but it was, like, it was like last week when we were up at Rab's and you'd suggested a wee team oh, go kart. Man. Like when we go to Scott Kart and Clyde Bank or whatever. Two seconds later, I jumped on Facebook. There it is, Scott Kart. Aye, it's aye. on your phone, though. On my phone. Mm. You know. So is that because I'm tapped into the same Wi-Fi as Rab? I don't is know, it because it be the microphone's picking up what we're talking about? Aye, aye. Let's just burn the phones and uh, <laughs> and have a real chat. Because yeah. it's you know it's like really though it's picking. I've up. got one of the Google Home devices. It Google YouTube just was like ah, here. Do you want this? Do you want this, mate? And I, <laughs> And you're like, I you must have thought I was going to buy Alexa or something like that, right? So anyway, just for some reason, YouTube goes here, we'll send you this for nothing. Mm -hmm. It's like, bang, send it. Sent it. Plug it in. No, I thought it was just my voice that would activate it, so it would be like daddy's toy, mm -hmm. right? And none of these toddler plebs in my household <laughs> getting a hoodie. One thing that's just for me that's not yeah, going to yeah. be smeared in fossilised Weetabix, right? <laughs> Little did I know. My Wayne's voices activate all the devices as well. So it's not just me going, hey, Google, play Royce the 5'9 on Spotify. It's like, play it's Baby my, Shark. It's my son going, play Moana. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or my, my, my daughter screaming. But the thing is, see, when you say, hey, Google, all the devices get activated. So it's all the phones. Like right now. Aye. Well, so it's exactly, <laughs> so it's like you think you're getting one of these things just to kind of simplify and streamline the home yeah. entertainment experience. And actually what you're getting is just all this kind of white noise in your mind because everybody's obsessed with their phone. Everybody's trying to communicate with their phone, avoiding each other, talking mm -hmm. to their phone. Yeah. And everybody's just talking to each other to their phone, you know. It's like, and you're having to put a bit of a weird voice on. Until it adapts to that. Uh, you know what I mean? So she was like, Alexa, because we get that Alexa in the house, you know what I mean? And it's the same. It's like, Alexa, you're, you're, you're please, always please, talking please. to it when I'm coming in. Shut your door and it's just you and you're away talking away to just it. chatting away, yeah, getting facts. Uh, Tell me about <laughs> heart conditions in Mexico in the 80s. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you're like, oh, I know a new thing now. You know, I could have just read that. You know, it's. But the thing with the social media, just kind of bring it back to the, the, the basic point. It's it, like everything that we create, it's all based on our instincts and impulses that we're hardwired to do. And these technologies are just extensions of what we want and what we desire. But I think sometimes it might be useful to perform basic risk assessments on some of this mm, stuff. Yeah. You know, what is the social impact going to be beyond the fact it's going to make somebody a lot of money? Like, let's test it. Let's run it. Let's like make that part of the research and development. And and I think like mm. what, what we always burn ourselves with this stuff, especially in a free market environment. No, I get too political, but in a free market environment where the main metric for justifying the creation of something is, well, hundreds of people buy it. And no, will it make them fat and kill them? Will mm -hmm. it make them hate each other? Will it induce Who cares misunderstanding? About that? Who cares about that? Aye, will it induce suicidal thoughts? You know? yeah. <laughs> like, just get it out there. <laughs> Prozac on the sandwiches. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it's so true, and it's so true. And I think as well, though, like even with development and new things, what sometimes you're maybe putting a bandage over, we're still not going to the source of what's going on. So it's like you might have something that helps mitigate that, but then what are the side effects of that? And it is it mostly is just due to profit is uh, why anything happens. I don't you know. know. I like the idea that I could talk to somebody who lives in Australia in real time, but I don't know if I'm supposed to be able to do mm -hmm. that. <laughs> like to yeah. the ex I don't know, like like no necessarily just hello, how you doing? Like arguing about something. And yeah. they're all the way literally on the other side of the world. And yeah. I'm here. It's like there's just so many layers of of of, of complexity that you just can't eat. And the way the brain's been pushed, you know, considering like the amount of time we spent with none of that, aye, aye. and now the, when the technologies came around, no wonder it's blowing minds like well, all over. That that actual logic there is like the opposite of hip hop. Mm. 
in terms of you know if you you know because obviously you're a hip hop artist which we'll, we'll definitely touch on but like the whole point of hip hop like you know I was watching uh, I think it was Talib Kweli's podcast and they were talking about like MC Hammer and like MC Hammer and I think it was in Vlad TV like you you didn't miss with MC Hammer now he had the cheesiest rap tune of all time you know like mm. but if he heard you you were talking about he would run up on people like in where they were and going right what are you saying about my tune you know mm. like you, you think it's funny do you <laughs> right one in the face whereas now it's like you can have that argument with someone in Australia or what not you know covered in crisp sat in your armchair crying into a Ben and Jerry <laughs> that <laughs> an immigrant delivered to you at four in the morning <laughs> and directly into your mouth do you know what I mean like, you know and it's like what, what, you know, it's crazy. People, is it because people just have too much to say now? Is it because we're too intelligent now that... There's no... Con see, when we're sitting here right now, one of the reasons we're subtly why we're behaving the way we are is not just because we are, like, we know we should. We have a subtle instinct to kind of... We're inhibited by being around other people, and this is nice in a certain sort of way. So if we talk about something that we disagree with, we have kind of social inhibitors that mean it's li it's not likely uh, that I'm just going to totally lose the plot or challenge you in a very direct and yeah. aggressive way. Mm -hmm. There are just certain social inhibitions that kick that in. That would right? be awkward, wouldn't it, man? <laughs> and that's just about preserving simple community life, yeah. right? If we all just flew off the handle naturally, we'd never be able to build a society, a civilization. Yeah. Teamwork and all that. When you go onto social media, especially if you're on any operating under anonymity, then the social constraint is lost. It's say what you want. It's gone. So people don't have a sense that they will be held accountable for what they say. And in some very narrow instances, this might be good, like somebody that's trying to topple a repressive regime in a, in a tyrannical state or somebody who's fleeing a violent abuser. And these are strong arguments for retaining anonymity. But I think when you weigh up the bigger harm of the trolling and the abuse that happens under the cover of anonymity and the damage that that's yeah. doing to social attitudes and beliefs and cohesion and just the stress and anxiety levels, I think outweighs any argument for anonymity. I think Twitter, Facebook, social media should be viewed as a public square. And so if you can use that, then you're going into a public square. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a public square, people can see who you are and they can identify they can touch you. you. If you can't go into a public square and say anything, don't. There are other ways to do things. You don't need to always be in the public realm. But uh, ultimately, that's what Twitter is. It's, it's, it's you walking out onto the street and saying, here's what I've got to say and everybody can see me saying it and I'll take the consequences of what I say. And I don't think that people will behave normally. Uh, or even something close to normal until until you take the masks off and say, right, what what was that you were saying there? What was that you were saying about say raping it. someone? I, or what was that you were there? You were saying you're going to come and do something to my kids? Yeah. Or what was that you were saying mm, there? Yeah, yeah. Jimmy yeah. from mm. Dumbarton. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what? Sorry, Jimmy. Sorry. Jim, Jimmy's like, sorry, I don't know what you mean, man. I was just pure, pure stressed out, man, yeah. on the algorithm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that That's such an interesting point, though. A great way to look at it. It is because the thing is, right, think about it when you grew up with wee guys in school, right? You always had that one mate that was a right wee cheeky so-and-so that had never been cracked in the face. Mm. And they always got away with being this wee cheeky guy. And it's like, if you're never sometimes put in check or that wee bit yeah. of confront, mm. confrontation, then mm. who is stopping you? The people, it's, the, it's the people that stare at you for a bus. You know, <laughs> well, like that, for a bus, you know what I mean? Totally, you ever totally. just want like that? Just, you know, I think I'm going to follow this bus down the road, you know what I mean? See if you've got to steal that hard, the fact yeah, I yeah, own it at the next yeah. stop, you know? And maybe they would, maybe yeah, they wouldn't. They? Yeah. But it's that whole kind of thing of having the protective. I'm going to do something because I don't think I'm going to need to account for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we can all be widows and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I certainly, even if I was on the bus and it was a bus full of big guys, right? I just wouldn't feel comfortable like staring at somebody mm -hmm. just to have this kind of battle between me and them just to just to feel hard. Because right. I just don't know if they're just going to pull a gun out or if they're just going to lob a brick through the window of the bus. I've always got this awareness yeah. that you never really know who you're talking to, so you should always be aware of what you say to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. I had this exact conversation with Kieran last night, exactly this, and I was saying that, whereas I'm like, I'm now at a point where... You know, I don't fly off the handle. It doesn't matter what you say to me or what situation. I'm going to be like, do I really want to get into it with this person? Who are they? Are they going to follow me home? Are they going to attack someone else? Who are they connected to? Is it actually worth it? No, it never is. It's got to be, it's got to, if the, if the line stepped over or, 
you know, the piss is getting taken. Then there's there are instances where maybe you have to put people in check, but for the majority of time, it's like, whoa, there's, there, that's not worth this. This is more a reflection of your anger, not mine. You yeah, know what I mean? I think so. And just that, that that's something also just that we need to consider with social media. Because obviously like, you can't you can't say, well, this would change if uh, individuals all sorted and became more responsible. It's a mix. There's got to be a desire between enough people to change their behaviour so that they can start to model a new way of being for other people. And then when more people adopt those behaviours, the market will register that and go... All right, so you just want a social platform that's not all about conflict. Mm -hmm. Let's tweak the algorithm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just know it's like it's really the only way that the, the way that our economy works is the, 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 every time we click and we log in, that's us telling Facebook and Twitter we like it the way it is. Mm -hmm. We like it even more intense than that. And and so like uh, we, there is a level of kind of being more conscious of. I can see my impulses, I can see what I want to do, the, those kind of initial thoughts that come in, but then I can kind of own that, I can observe that and choose to act in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I try to do that, and, and, and I'm, I'm human, so I'll fail at it sometimes, or I'll lose the plot, and it'll maybe be maybe two or three hours, or even a week before I realise, and I have that, oh, that spiritual toothache, where it's just like, oh man, I said things I didn't mean, and I feel bad and often I'll even publicly say things like that because I feel like if I behave in a certain way publicly I've got to account for it publicly mm -hmm. I can't publicly be a dick and then privately apologise for it you know just <clears throat> the, the amends got to be at the I level like of, the amends got to be at the level of the harm yep. and so I tie myself in knots with this sometimes mm -hmm. but I'm always trying to get back to that place of awareness and sanity and being more measured and not judgmental and I think that's all we can do. I don't think we can kind of... I don't think this is... I don't think utopia is going to materialise beyond yeah. the horizon line if we yeah, all do yeah. that. But there's a balance between the society we want to live in and also how we want to feel on a daily basis. I mean, I deal with some people on social media from time to time who've got a lot of followers and they're very kind of... They're, 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 I don't want to use... I was going to say a cult there, but even there I'm like, I'm being conscious in my language. You know, they've got very passionate followers... And they don't really believe in having dialogue or communicating with people outside of, of their movement, right? Cool, whatever works for them. And any time I deal with the guy who is actually kind of the figurehead of this, I just get the sense that for all of his powers of analysis and how intelligent he might be in some areas, he's very emotionally stunted. And therefore, I can never truly have a dialogue with him because as well as the exchange, there's all this ulterior motive going on. Mm where I'm just like feeling like I'm dealing with my son. You know what I mean? Like it's mm. just a kind of a very low emotional maturity level. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, there's just an argument there for completely disengaging. Mm -hmm. But the ego will draw you in because yeah. he says something that you think, oh, other people can see what he said to me there. So I don't want to look like I'm taking that crap. Uh. I better get back on that. And, and, and sometimes that's a hard thing to do. It's dead counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Like going like that, do you know what? I'm going to let you think that about me. I'm going to let you say that to me in front of people. And I'm just walking away. And I don't care. I'm not getting drawn in. That is the bold thing to do. That is the hard thing to mm. do. But every part of your conditioning would tell you that's not the bold thing to do. But that totally is. Especially growing up in a scheme <sighs> where you're like, your whole mental faculty clicks right into place like somebody pulling the trigger of a gun when you're in conflict. Like for me, that's when I feel sharpest. That's when I feel most game. Like if I feel like, uh, you know, in the hip hop scene, for example, right? So like, I'm not the sort of person who runs around creating conflicts uh, anymore and haven't been for a long time. But every couple of years, I kind of have to get dragged back into the hip hop community to account for myself because someone who's part of a new generation of rappers or somebody is like deciding that they're going to say something or do something to me. And I always, on one hand, want to walk away from it. But there comes a point when I feel like I can't. No, I always can. But there's the ego and there is the competitiveness. And then there's the, when you really sit down and think about it, what did you say to me? <laughs> like, how did you say that in front of you? How many views did you get for saying that? Well, well, let me start taking some notes, you know, and then there's a punchline comes out, and then another punchline comes out, and then I put it away for a few weeks. And I'm like, what are they saying now? I don't tell anybody. You know, I'm already planning the right. all-out assault on this person. <laughs> they don't know. Yeah, yeah. They don't know, so they think I've backed down. <laughs> so it's like, I'm not even just, I'm not even, like, getting into conflict where my mind focuses. I'm vindictive with it. Like, I'm menacing with it. 
Like, I'm sitting thinking at every angle and how to launch it on you and how terrible you're going to feel and how much you're going to regret saying it. And as satisfying as that is in the moment... Is it worth it, really? It's, ah, ah, just, it doesn't sit with me. No, the real me. It's not the real me. It's, it's just a wee kind of... It's adaptations I had to go through mm-hmm. to feel safe. And it's like, I want to let that go. But don't diss me, because I'm not ready to let it go. Yeah. But it's like, I just want to be able to walk away from things. Do you find writing it down just gets out of your system? Or writing your response that you never post, just that's it? Uh, I got. I had a battle like, in the last couple of years. It was kind of a situation similar to what I'm describing there. And, you know, somebody being very direct and very aggressive and, and very intimidating, right? So it wasn't just that I felt intimidated, it was that I looked like I was being intimidated, which is much worse for me. Like, I'm more likely to get in about it with you. It's that additional thing of an audience seeing me looking like I'm intimidated that I don't like, you know, that I feel uncomfortable with. And it was like, I it was just, it, it was, it was, it was not just the catharsis of writing it down. It was the fantasy, the revenge fantasy. Mm. You know, like, yeah, yeah. It, it kind of, it was like, I'm, I'm, uh, I know you're a tough guy and I know everybody thinks you're a tough guy but we'll see how tough you're going to look when when, uh, when, it, when it really comes down to it and you're surprised by the fact that I've turned up by myself uh, to face you with full awareness of all the things that might go down you know what I mean mm-hmm. and uh, and and Funnily enough, you usually get somebody's respect after you do that. That usually yeah. kind of something clicks. They go, all right, maybe I wasn't dealing with the sort mm-hmm. of person that I thought I was dealing with. Mm-hmm. But I always feel regret after it. Because, mm-hmm. like, I mean, I'm performing a surgical procedure on you verbally in a battle, and if it's personal, that you're not going to walk away from you know, without feeling really bad. But I walk <laughs> away from it feeling really bad. Aye. And I, and, and Nobody wins there. Nah. But I think it's, it's kind of like, though, that like writing a nice rhyme or nice lyric that flows well is kind of like like when you're DJing and you know the track that's coming next, you're like, man, they're, they're not going to love this. They're not ready. Uh-huh. And it's, it's the same as writing, whether it's comedy or whatever. So I can't wait to get to this punchline because they're going to go, man, uh-huh. yeah, I totally. should not have met him. I, I kept my last battle, like the guy tapped out after the first round. So I've never seen that in a battle before. It was just like, he just gave Kudos up. Kudos to him, though, no, for absolutely, actually walking away. Absolutely. But you could see, I was so hell-bent on, like, destroying him that I lost sight of the fact we were performing at a memorial event for a friend okay. of ours in the community who had died and that I had agreed to do the battle to draw the crowd there. So, on one sense, like, they asked for a battle, they got a battle, right? And I wasn't going to pull any punches just because of the nature of the event. I don't think that's what Callum would have wanted. But at the same time, uh, like, I remember looking around the audience once it was over. Because it was like, it was that way, like, you know that way, like, um, you look around and you think, why is everyone not cheering? And everyone has this look of, like, shock and almost, like, emotional <laughs> trauma on their face. Well, he's actually and it's basically, too far. <laughs> I, and everybody, this is a scene full of battles. I mean, I'm standing around battle rappers who are actually the battle rappers doing it new mm-hmm. in Scotland. And they've all got this face on, like, I, I've took it too far. Like, I'm being gratuitous. But they didn't have anything to say when this guy was goading me publicly for months mm-hmm. and months and trying to intimidate me and they were all buying into it. So it was like, I was kind of battling them as well. And and still, even then, I remember looking at them and and just and I said something at the end of it. I was like, I so now we all understand what this is. I was talking to them, you know, the battlers in the audience. And still, man, I don't know, I went away, phoned my missus. She was pure chuffed that I had won, and I was like, I tapped out after one round. Can you believe it? And ah, uh, even to this day, having met the boy properly and have an understanding of his nature, he's all right. And I just think you're just a lovable guy. <laughs> And you've got problems and you've had problems that are dead similar to mine. And probably because of our similarities, we have clashed because there's something about people who have the same problems who kind of either are drawn into friendships or drawn into conflict like magnets. Mm-hmm. And uh, and just like people ask me still to this day, do you want to battle again? Will you come and battle? And will you come and battle? And I just say, the only time you ever see me battling is if somebody personally attacks me and that's how I have to resolve it. But I don't enjoy it. It's like mm. it's like psyching yourself up for a fight. It makes you feel <clears throat> sick, you know. It's not a nice emotion, really. I guess. Nah, it's not a sustainable emotion. Mm. You know, it's it's just like it's something. I don't know. It's like I can only compare it to something like lust. Like lust is a nice thing when it comes over you, 
in a nice moment when it's appropriate. But you couldn't just walk around all the time in a lustful state. <laughs> no. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> nothing else is getting in there. You just couldn't. You just couldn't. Like you know, emotions need to be processed and moved through in order to be truly experienced. At the right time. And so, like, if you're just walking around like I often have done in the past, where you're just in this kind of vengeful mind state, or you're just thinking about like settling a score, uh, then you know I'm I, I I become unwell with doing that stuff. You know, and that's recognizing that. And recognising how that plays out in my life on social media, in relationships, in music. Mm -hmm. I think for me, rap is actually probably the healthiest place for me to express a range of emotions that maybe wouldn't be socially appropriate in a lot of other disciplines that I'm working in now. Maybe besides for the book. Yeah, but hip-hop's great for that. It's great because it's like, first of all, usually I'm performing to the home crowd. They've got 20 years of context to understand why I'm referencing what I'm referencing, yeah. where I'm coming from emotionally. I don't need to keep qualifying everything I say with speaking as a da 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 da. They get me. They understand it. And so for the hip hop crowd, uh, then then I just always feel uh, like they know me best, so I can be my most vulnerable and most honest and most open. Because uh, you're you're dealing with people ultimately. That, like if all this ended for me tomorrow for some reason. I'm never being turned away for the hip hop community in Scotland. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen, and that's my real tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah, yeah. underneath everything else. Well, talking about tracks, uh, one of your recent ones, great video as well, Scotland Today, um, amazing. Like, really love it. And I was talking to you about it uh, over. You know, the the production on it's great. The the bagpipes, it's really really quite, uh, you know, patriotic in, in a way. Is, yeah. um, Shout out to Jim Sutherland who composed it. Well done, Stephen Jim. Reynolds did the video for it. Really, really good. So you filmed that in Edinburgh. So tell us a wee bit about that, because lyrically, you're talking about stuff that, you know, ticks the boxes for me anyway. Yeah, and Production-wise for me, like the bagpipes, the way they sat in yeah. the mix were just they yeah, were pretty I'm, epic. I'm, 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 I'm Makes you want to march. <laughs> glad you think that, because what, 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 um, so how that song came about was, um, I came into contact with a composer, a musician, uh, very well-respected one, called Jim Sutherland uh, a few years back. And uh, basically there was a piece of music on his SoundCloud page that I thought was really, really nice. And it was kind of almost orchestral in the sense of, no, it was like a quartet or something like that, right? So it was like some strings and, I string quartet, maybe that's the right terminology. I'm just trying to think how many instruments were on, but they were all strings, apart from the big drums. And anyway, I was like, I would love to rap on that but uh, I'll need to see if the instrumental's available. So anyway, I asked him, he was like dead up for it. So I went and I got the piece, and then there was another piece, and he had a choir over it, and it was Gaelic, and, and I was like, like well, can you hang me the vocals, uh, the game, get the instrumental version of that, keep some of the vocal in? So I started kind of moving in this other direction a wee bit. And then uh, he had sent me, we, then we got asked, we'd done those, we, we released those tunes, they did very, very well, I incorporated them into my friend's show, people really loved it, and what I found was they had a kind of, in Scotland at least, they had a, they had a certain crossover appeal, no one in mainstream, but because the music was so arresting for people who might, might be put off by an, an obtrusive hip hop beat, um, they tended not to question the, the, the rapping, the accent or anything. They sort of saw it as poetry. Mm -hmm. So it was, what I was trying to do was place the rap in a new context that was more culturally acceptable so that really I could kind of smuggle hip-hop in mm -hmm. to a different form to uh, to take it into the fringe and, and you know, these people who part with money <laughs> for your art, you know, basically, yeah. to be quite frank. So, <laughs> um, and so what, what happened was then... Uh, we got asked to write some music for this documentary called Scheme Birds, which is a film by a Scandinavian company that was supported by Creative Scotland. So they asked us to write some of the score and uh, they asked us to write two songs. And eventually we spent a lot of time writing the songs. It was a lot of back and forth at the last minute. The, 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 the film company, the guy we were dealing with, was giving us all sorts of crazy notes. Change this, can, or can you not do something more poppy? Or can you not do something? And I was like, I'm out, man. Like, I, I, like I, this is the only time I've got to write what I've wrote, and these are great songs. And uh, they end up taking the very first tune that I ever done with Jim that was already recorded and in the vault <laughs> years before. And so we, we, we suddenly just had this tune 
And uh, I was like, right, cool, well, we'll get a video done for it then and we'll just put it out. And, like, the lyrics for it came about pretty quickly, actually, because it was just one of the ones where you're really taking a punchline rap approach, but you're um, thinking about politics and so social issues. So you're still, you're, you're, you're doing the setup. it's got to rhyme, and it's got to have a good punch, uh, but they've all got to land politically. And I just thought, what I would like to do is something that's kind of not necessarily coming at it from a certain angle, but really just a kind of, uh, it's like, it's like seeing you, Scarface when people bust into a room with Tommy guns and they just spray the whole room. Yeah, it was like that. You know, like what I was trying to show was the kind of internal and in the inconsistencies and contradictions across various viewpoints. Almost just like an intellectual exercise for myself of just being still able, even though I've got my own convictions. Still being able to see the absurdity in a lot of my own opinions mm. and a lot of the people yeah. that agree with us opinions. And also as a listener experience, what you're doing is you're drawing a lot of people in who are getting the catharsis of hearing people you, hearing you criticise people they don't like, which then puts them in an emotional state where you can criticise them. You know, because I think conditions have to be right before people become willing to analyse their own beliefs. And one way of buttering them up to do that is to say, hi, look at their, their dicks, aren't they, over there? And they're yeah. like, hi, they're dicks. And they're like, well, you're a dick or not, I'm a dick. <laughs> Aye. And it's a bit easier to yeah, be yeah. kind of own the dickishness when we're all doing it together. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of kind of thought goes into the song prior, and then obviously you, you kind of be that complex in the execution. But the ulterior of a lot of my songs is all about that, kind of emotion in an emotionally intelligent way, trying to think, how is a listener from a certain background or experience or linguistic capability or whatever, intersecting with this music. How am I kind of peeling the onion for them in a certain way that means that my message has the maximum mm -hmm. potential to reach them, to persuade them, uh, to make them think, and and that's what I enjoy doing the most. I love it. It's, it's amazing because it's love like, it. you know, you're hitting it in so many different fronts, like lyrically, you know, and you've got the visual there as well, and then sonically. So it's like, I mean, it must be important to get them all right. It's it, one of the, I wouldn't even say frustrations for me. I've just become resigned to it. But sometimes it does disappoint me that the level of time and thought that I put into my music, that it's not had a level of impact beyond Scotland, mm -hmm. that I feel that artistically it warrants. Uh, and I'm not the only artist in Scotland who feels that way, one, yeah. and two, who probably deserves a bit wider acknowledgement. There is an issue around the Scottish accent. Yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily because it's Scottish and or, or, or that there's too much should be read into English imperialism and da 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 because Scottish people are just as likely to laugh at an Irish rapper when they hear them for the first time. And there's no necessarily mm -hmm. loads of undercurrent about it, although I do sympathise with people who do want to retrofit um, their initial hunch that might be wrong with something that makes it seem more valid when really human beings are nasty, we laugh at things that we don't understand, people don't understand Scottish rap, yeah, 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 yeah. we laugh at it. And then there's obviously the other paradox of people being presented with it naturally and rightly as a black art form. So there's the compounding effect of it not just being Scottish, but it's a wee white guy talking mm -hmm. about buck fast at first. And so there's all sorts of things, but just the amount of thought that I put into the songs, I mean, conceptually, the amount of thought that I put into them lyrically, uh, the amount of time that I spend thinking about how I'm approaching them vocally, uh, and also just the breadth of work that I've done, you know, yeah. like some of it is stronger than others, but when 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 my stuff connects, it really connects. Yeah. And uh, I mean, because everything exists digitally, you never know, you could re-release things and promote, promote things and repackage things and give them a new lease of life and maybe I'll look at doing that. But it, it has made me come to the conclusion that I need to take the music away from the pure hip hop aesthetic uh, if I want it to be uh, financially and time efficient for me mm -hmm. because the amount of time I put into it, yeah. the return's got to be there. So it's got to be ready to go to the fringe. It's got to be mm -hmm. ready to port to arts venues. Uh, I can't just be going out into the community and rapping for the rappers, which I love doing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that hip hop where everybody wants a guestie and the ones that only yeah. wanting guesties on the pay and then sneaking in and they're not giving you money. And that's all good, do you know what I mean? But it's like... There's uh, only so many times you can do it. Got two kids, you know what I mean? So it's yeah, a hard... Totally. It's, it's, it's not a great argument to be making. Oh, I'm going out four nights a week <clears> down to the <throat> nice and sleazies, do you know what I mean? For the cipher. 
do you mind watching these wins again? Yeah. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think though, what's really cool then about your hip hop? It is a definite reflection of what I've read online of your friend shows, and it's basically yourself taking all the contradictions you've done throughout your life and facing it head on, taking responsibility for your own life and your own actions. And again, that comes with self awareness. I also think. I was going to say it earlier, this is the fun thing about getting a wee bit older and you start, you know, you really start thinking about your actions in a different way and how they may impact others, not just yourself, you know. So it sounds like your music is the same as your show. I'd love, love to come and see one of your shows, man. I definitely will do that. I think what I'm going to be doing uh, this year, just because it's a bit less labour intensive than writing a show, because like, think about... People who watch me doing things, they usually are watching me doing things in one discipline. So people who read my book, they're only interested in the book. They're not really going to follow the music and vice versa, right? A lot of the time. You do have some people who just go, they oh, like does you. that, does that, yeah. they're into that, they're invested in it. But ultimately, like, I'm working across multiple disciplines, including writing for papers and doing public speaking and community stuff and all that. And so ultimately, like, I can't actually operate at that level of output and retain the quality for too much longer. I mean, I burnt myself out trying to do it. You know, you're going to write a fringe show, learn the fringe show, perform it for a month in Edinburgh while trying to finish a book and meet mm -hmm. a deadline yep. and doing media and having two kids and running around like a blue arsed fly, quite frankly. So, like, this year, I kind of I like the idea of doing a kind of ask me anything format. And having a show that is improvisational and funny and contains elements of music and rap and comedy, like what I have been doing live, but ultimately that I'm generating the material off of things that the audience are asking me, because increasingly, and I think you guys will, will know more about this than me, the, the media that is succeeding most and the media that is in the ascendant is the media that includes the audience in the conversation. Mm -hmm. People don't want to just be told this is what it is. Like, go to theatre for that. You know, go to theatre for that. Like, people are are, 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 are are watching my stuff, not because they just want to hear me speak. They they also, they think they, they want to be challenged. They want to say something. Mm -hmm. And the amount of messages I get from people after a show tells me it would be better for me. I'd get up the road sooner if I just let them ask me the question yeah. as, as the show. Do you know what I mean? Because I love I talking love to people. I love talking to people. I love having a conversation. But see, when you've been doing a show and you're da da da, -da and it's like you're you're in the middle of the fringe and you're just like it's just a pure creative street fight in the fringe, right? Then uh, it's difficult to give people your full attention. So I just thought, why not create a show out of that and just call it something like Citizens Assemble or something? It's just a picture of yeah. me handing a megaphone to the crowd. Yeah. And I'll have wee bits that I can fall back on if it's drying up and. But mostly, and I tried it at King Tut's before Christmas there, and it was great. Everybody loved it. And it was like, it was the right balance of light and serious. And also, it was good for me to be personal in a way. It was good for me to be personal in a way that reflects where I am now. So often I'm asked to recount the past and my childhood and get personal in that way. But it doesn't really give people much insight into me mm -hmm. and what I actually do now and how, what I believe and what I feel and what I go through and, 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 and the audience seemed to really connect with that stuff. It was good. Yeah, it's good. It's a nice balance because, you know, you hear the, the different viewpoints where, like, the audience don't know what they want until you give it to them as well. You've, I've heard that loads from artists and music. So it's like, you know, hearing that from you as well, it's good. That balance of, you know, the inclusiveness or getting the audience involved mm -hmm. versus what you want actually mm -hmm. as an artist mm -hmm. to put out. And again, know? having those bits, though, that you can fall back mm -hmm. on as yeah. well. That, that, that are that, solid. That, I mean, that, that, that even applies to us. And I think, the, I think talks, so. the talks that we do and stuff, and there, there are certain scripted bits I have that I know I can go to that will get a wee laugh or I'll get, right, okay, I know how to insert myself into this next bit. And then there's other bits I'd actually much rather just wing it and just have it like that because it's a nice kind of... Yeah. If you, again, you need to have the experience of going through it. It's like freestyling. Though, like freestyling, mm -hmm. you've got to have the experience of doing it enough times that, okay, if all goes, I know I can do this unscripted, no mm -hmm. bother. Um, and that's that's awesome. That's awesome. So I mean, I think that's what we've really managed to encapsulate in this podcast, though, is like we're really more talking about you, the modern down mm. and what's happening. Yeah. The your documentary series on BBC was absolutely awesome. 
Haven't caught them all, I will be honest, but I have, I've seen a couple of them and it's tremendous stuff. Haven't caught stuff. them all? That sounds like a medication, doesn't it? Like I you would get to help you sleep or something. Or a disease. <laughs> <laughs> Coronavirus. I haven't caught uh, them all. We haven't mentioned it. <laughs> but um, w one thing I did want to ask was, what's been your main takeaway from that series? Because you delved into some really dark areas, but also some more positive stuff. So what's the takeaway from it? What's the What can we implement? The central takeaway, wow... Um, because of my I experienced it on different levels. There was experience of actually making it and conceiving of it in collaboration with the the production company and the BBC, and then there was experience of going out into the community. Um, I guess what I never necessarily learned, but what was what was confirmed for me and something I've been arguing for a long time, is that I. Media landscape largely dominated by well-meaning and intelligent middle-class people uh, needs to be led into these communities by people who come from these communities uh, because you can develop a certain rapport with potential contributors that a journalist who comes from a middle-class background just can't conjure because actually people in schemes are really sceptical of media institutions and journalists and, and so they should be. Mm -hmm. And so when I went into these communities, I was I was supported uh, and encouraged and, and sometimes got into like back and forth debates creatively with people who come from middle class backgrounds, who have been to university, who are trained in the traditional ways, but ultimately they recognised that my area of expertise was practical and social and cultural. And the way that I speak to people, the way that I engage with people, uh, how I'm able to switch up how I talk depending on who mm -hmm. I'm speaking to. And also, when I'm asking someone about how they got parked on methadone for 20 uh, years after being offered it by an abusive, grooming male boyfriend, right, as a kid, uh, I'm not just asking a person, I'm not asking a woman just to tell me that. I'm telling her something about me first. I'm saying, look, I recognise the value and the difficulty of what you're saying, so let me tell you a wee bit about my addiction, right? Uh, let me tell you a wee bit about my background because that's ethical mm -hmm. that's an ethical way to conduct yourself you know I know that they don't train you and I've studied journalism so I know they don't train you to do that but that doesn't just because you've not been trained doesn't mean you can't develop your own practice your own ethics and for me that was the key thing media functions best when there's multiple perspectives looking at the issue mm -hmm. so when people are sitting around the table saying today let's discuss gender fluidity or today let's discuss racial issues if it's just a bunch of people for the same kind of background class wise it doesn't matter how diverse the people around the table are if they all come from the same social class you're gonna get content that reflects the blind mm -hmm. spots and biases and aspirations and personal tastes of people who come from that social class. Mm -hmm. And it's better, it's a better learning experience as well because I felt like it was really collaborative. Me and the director, Stephen Bennett, and uh, Kira, We've Kira, East, yeah, yeah, Kira East, who was the assistant producer, yeah. and Harry Bell, who <laughs> run, runs Turn TV. And it was like, you know, like we all had our wee moments and all that, but it was a lot of respect there. Yeah. A lot of respect there. And, and you just need to look at the finished product to see that the chemistry was there. It worked well, mate. Aye. And even just well. like, even just like letting me get the hip hop in it, you know, the beats mm -hmm. and. That's cool. Like, you know, it was most of, most of the soundtrack was all stuff that was made That's by amazing. people in the community. Again, it's that encompassing art form, isn't it? You get your music in, you get the visuals, get the message across. If you can do all of that in the one thing, phew, Aye. Great. Uh, great. The next thing I think we'll probably do something that's a wee bit less... I need to get away from the, doing the TV stuff about addiction or not because I'm no longer at rehab and I just need to kind of like focus on recovery and no be in the environments with people. Because yeah. I was out there filming that stuff and one part of me's like, ah, oh man, that's terrible. That guy's got a dislocated shoulder but he can't go to the hospital because he'll get kicked out of his house or something like that, you know what I mean? And then the other part of me's like, ah, it'd be dead easy for me to score right now. Mm -hmm. You know, standing with us, 80 homeless people queuing up outside a sh in the doorway of a shutdown Marks and Spencers for soup. And uh, dead easy to score right now. You know, I wonder where they're all going now. They're all steaming, shouting, fighting in the street. That looks like a great time. You know what I mean? Aye, <laughs> I'll go into the shop and buy Bevy for you. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. And you're just being slowly drawn in. Well, it's well an, done, it, though. It's the environment thing, isn't it? 
the, the, you know, the environment fuels what what you're up to. And if you're it? not if you're not taking care of yourself, mm. you know, if you're no, I think it was it was it was kind of almost like method acting, where I was getting dangerously close to like really really screwing up, you mm. know, like. Well, well done for holding back, mate. <laughs> like, well done, yeah, well, well done, big achievement, you know, and that, and that that's it though. But I think again. Self awareness massively plays into that, and the fact that you're saying, Do you know what, can you take me out of doing that genre for a wee minute? Aye. I've got my own stuff to focus on. That's great, Aye. and the fact that you're willing to admit to that is that the, well, that's why you're in the position you are, mate. Aye. You know, it's Cheers. pretty cool. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I want to move into other styles and all. I, I, I would like to be interviewing not just poor people. Yeah. I want to talk to the people that think they're really clever. Not the people you need to can constantly reiterate that they have something of value to say. I want to talk to the people who are constantly spouting stuff because they just feel like they, they know mm. everything mm. and the clever people I want to go to boarding schools I want to talk to billionaires and just like getting about it you speaking know? of interesting people Russell Brand mm -hmm. you went down there and spoke oh, to yeah, him yeah, yeah. how was that for you well, how the how does I, I mean we've been that? a fan of Russell for how long I know man and every oh. sort of thing he's done a discipline from his journey mm. oh, so he's Christ. been very open and honest and yeah. following him is very respectful yeah. watching how he's Boyfie done Paul, look, I've, been I mean? in, I've been <laughs> into Russell Brand for a while because for two reasons one he's very articulate and speaks very well and just has this kind of almost musical command of language and it's like there's just a certain it doesn't matter whether he's talking simple or whether he's using bigger words there's a kind of harmony produced by yep. the way he just arranges language and I think it's because he talks for the heart and his comedic value aye, as well aye. His so presence is... I'm into that and then also anybody in the recovery community knows Russell Brand's journey he's one of the most high profile recovering addicts in the country and in the world actually probably the biggest aye one so, so everybody knows him from that and then basically I think when he sort of retreated from celebrity lifestyle and all that he kind of relaunched with a podcast mm -hmm. uh, and and so his team were basically did a call out who would you like us to interview and this is one of the great things like about my I don't like calling them fans people that follow me right people who like check for what I say and that like they they, they keep me up on any of these things right so they're like Russell Brand should I get an interview and all that and then so basically they all start noising up Russell Brand and then once I realised that they're doing that, I kind of like try to coordinate it a wee bit. So I'll like say, here, I'm just saying, <laughs> if you're into the idea of me being interviewed by Russell Brand, here's what today. And it was like, it was like, I won. It was like a selection of people that were getting uh, put forward for it, including like Richard Branson and... Uh, I think Jim Carrey and all of that. Right. And uh, it was just like, they just ended up having to ask me. Because I don't think that he had known me at this point. I hadn't kind of blown up and maybe, and no, no, that I've blown up, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, to the like, sense of where you're at. I was yeah. on people's radar, but other people were like, I don't know who this guy is, what are you tweeting about, you know? So it just ended up being so many people had like recommended me more than all these other people. <laughs> And wow. uh, so they just got me in here. So he was up at the Edinburgh Playhouse because he was on tour. And so I went there to do the interview. And it was cool when I met him. I realised he was very tired. And I was very tired. So it was just nice because I was like... I still had this image of Russell Brand being that kind of like... Uh, sort of frenetic energy. Jumping. Just a pinball. Just having... Mm -hmm. I just thought so much energy I will use just trying to follow where he's going. But it wasn't like that that day. And then I realised actually it wasn't like that. Like, he's not like that now. He's different, you know, he's chill. Mm -hmm. So we were just sat and we chatted. And what I liked about him was um, he was very actively listening to me. Um, and, and it's nice when people actively listen. But it's nice when people who, like, see, how do I word that? When people could just be inauthentic because they're so famous and so well off, they wouldn't really need to listen to you. They could literally just pick you up, take what they need and just pop you off and, and, and it wouldn't matter. They wouldn't need to care that they needed to listen to you. Uh, and it just didn't feel like that when I spoke to them. And, um, and, and, and it was just really nice and authentic. And then he got, gave us tickets to uh, his show the next night in Glasgow and that subsequently ended up being the first night out that me and my partner had had. Uh, since my daughter had been born, so it was quite a romantic night out, 
and uh, and it was just really nice, you know. And I have kind of now and again have contact with him or any of the people that I, I I'm I'm lucky enough to meet. I've not actually ever been disappointed by any like stars that I've mm -hmm. come that I've run into. What I've kind of noticed is it's usually the kind of mid level people that are dicks. See the people whose like success is guaranteed and undeniable, and who have been acknowledged and financially remunerated Secure. for right, it. Yeah. Uh, like fair enough there's an ego at play but it's, it's a natural amount of ego compared to how like surreal the circumstances of their life are so they might be a bit self-referential or they might be a bit sort of uh, you know like they might seem a bit reclusive but that, that that's only because when people talk to them they always ask them about them so they're just conditioned to talk that way, you know? Or it might be like, I don't know, referring the conversation back to themselves or whatever, right? Like, uh, uh, but right at the core of most of the people that I've met, they're just nice, normal people who kind of like a mixture of hard work and got lucky and they know that. And this humanised a lot of people for me in a way, you know? Which is nice. Aye. Aye. Interesting point about the people in the middle, though, that still have a lot to prove but think they know it all. Aye, I've, mm. I've just found, like, you know, it's usually in the corridors of media environments, but it's not, not so much now. But before, uh, before it was kind of like this way, Mr McGarvey, it was like more sort of, you're talking to someone and then someone more important walks in the room and, and that person literally just acts like you've evaporated into thin air. Yeah, not a nice feeling, not a nice It's not a nice feeling, but you know, it's one of those ones you're like, it's good, I'm glad I know where I stand mm -hmm. with you. You know what I mean? And 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 so like, I try not, people, people tend to say nice, generous things to you in media places, right? Even if you're pure bombed, right? They'll be supportive and encouraging. So I think it's better in a media environment, you know, the people, the backroom people, the production assistants, the directors and all that, they're, they're lovely. But there is an authenticity at play constantly because everybody has to be nice to each other because they all work together all the time. Yeah. And so, like, don't take take everything with a pinch of salt. <laughs> if somebody's saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, yeah. this is a, just a, like, genius, you're just like, hey, whatever. You know what I mean? Just the same way if, yeah. they, if they ignore you because they don't think you're important. Mm. Wow. Aye. Wow. I mean, we could, I, I think that's, we could keep going. Yeah, we could. We could. Going. Uh, I mean, one thing I was wanting to bring up was Soma School. So yeah. you've been booked to do a talk there. Yeah, that's um, right. I think so it's a panel I'll be panel. part of, aye. Mm -hmm. So we're a part of that just through what we do in the community and the business. And Soma School is one of those things. It's just from Soma Records, you know, the legendary slam and, and whatever else. And they've got this amazing thing, Soma School, and bringing guys in yourself. So excited. Have you put any that. thought into that yet? Or do you know much about it yet? With, with panels, I tend to just kind of like, I just, I just go there and like feel it out when I'm there. One, I, if I was if I was to put preparation time in every everything I'm invited to now, I wouldn't have time to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I kind of operate off on the hoof a wee bit. See, when it's a panel discussion, it's a lot more natural. Yeah, easier. All right, so I'm looking forward it's conversational, to conversational, isn't it? it? And do you know what? See, for me, it's always nice to be acknowledged by the music industry yeah. in a kind of formal way. Because I know I'm part of the industry in Scotland and I know people in the industry know I'm part of the industry. And, like, you would struggle to find somebody working in the music industry in Scotland who's not heard of Loki, mm -hmm. right? And doesn't know what it is. Uh, but at the same time, it's like I still operate almost as an outsider yeah. or feel like an outsider. So it's just nice when somebody like, you know, reputable people in the industry say, here, do you want to come along and talk about mental health? Aye, totally. To like, you know, a, a massive techno crowd, really. And from a completely different genre, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's, totally. that, that's the cool thing. I mean, we, we as Stephen said, we'll be there, we'll be doing some demos and stuff. So come and get a shot of all the new Pioneer stuff and all <laughs> that, that that we'll have. Off. You know, it'd be nice to, to meet up with you there, man. Sounds good. But awesome. So I see even before we absolutely wrap up, yeah, what's yeah. what's on the horizon? What's coming? What are you working on? What can you talk about? Let's plug it. I'm trying to finish my second book right now. Um, I've got not got till the end of March. I've kind of set myself a deadline to, to, to try and turn in a first draft by the end of March. Uh, although I'm not going to make myself ill over it. Mm -hmm. Um, and whenever I get the chance, I continue to work on my, my project, my music project that I'm working on just now. Uh, although it's just been difficult to turn it around because it's difficult to find the time. Um, apart from that, like really just kind of, just, just focusing on keeping well. Mm -hmm. And if I keep well, the other things work out. So I've got to always just keep that at the forefront of my mind. Like what am I doing today? Just going to try and drink some water. Should I meditate this morning? Uh, I'll I'll make sure I deal with that tomorrow. You know, mm -hmm. just being present, 
in the moment and just like letting everything else sort itself out beyond my awareness. I love that. So you're like keeping well first. Yeah. Because yeah. if you know if you're not coming from a place of being well, then your music or your Everything's comedy suffer, isn't mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. And you're off to Inverness after this, aren't you? I am. I am. Got. I'm going to uh, speak at a conference tomorrow about trauma and uh, domestic violence. And a lot of people are going to share stories. Other people work in these sectors and given insight and all that. So I'll probably go up and do a wee mix of both. Cool. Sounds like it's going to be really cheery. I was going to say, <laughs> it, sound, it sounds like it's going to be quite the heavy day. So hopefully we've set you up Aye. a wee bit and, you know, with, uh, with more. But I mean, the thing is, important stuff you're doing, mate. So, Aye. you know, hats off to you. Thank you. Listen, yeah. I've had a great time, man. Like, I know Likewise. you asked me to come here and talk about myself, but I'm conscious of the fact Maybe I talked about myself a bit too much. Not at all. But either way, uh, it's been a lovely conversation and I do think this is an amazing environment and just like well done for like hanging in there to pull it together because it's, so, it's so easy just to patch <laughs> totally, it. Totally. Just like, I mean, there's ah! so many, right, we're patching this over the years. How but many times? Close. How many? Yesterday was another one. I know. But, uh, Close. I, you know, I appreciate you coming in, mate. That's, you know, well, it means a lot. We can make it happen again, easy. And you're talking about maybe doing something. So if you're never looking for two interesting guys, maybe we can come <laughs> on and speak to you. you know no, what problem, I mean? no problem, no problem. Brilliant, mate. Well, everybody, that has been Loki. Thanks so much. Dar McGarvey, this has been episode 34 of the Escapade Show. And what a show it was. Right. So, Boom. thanks again. See you soon. See you soon.